The Strategy of Information with Nick Inglis on InfoGov.net. On today's The Strategy of Information, Nick Inglis talks with Rob Bowe, a 17-time Microsoft MVP and one of the most knowledgeable folks on the Microsoft information ecosystem. As you'll hear in the conversation, Rob is one of the kindest gents in the information space and his knowledge is vast. Stay tuned for a thought-provoking and technology-forward episode today on the strategy of information with Nick Inglis on infogov.net. Consistency in the information profession is something that is hard to come by. Few things remain the same in our space. Our technology continues to advance. We can talk about and reminisce about the technology of the past. Microfiche and microfilm, server rooms, mainframes, dead computer languages, and our collective advancements. If you look at the people who have been guiding our profession, even that has changed pretty drastically over the past 20 years. Names that were once familiar have faded into the background and new faces and names have come and taken their place. With all of that change, when you see a person weathering every single storm and staying at the top of the profession over that same period of time, I really want to dig in to understand what that person is doing right. That's why I'm excited for today's episode of the Strategy of Information. Our guest today is the brilliant mind who has served most of his career in the Microsoft world. Today, SharePoint, Office 365, Teams. Uh, Our guest has been at the top of this space for nearly two decades now as a 17-time recipient of the Microsoft MVP Award. He has uh, keynoted for the top conferences around the world and is an immovable rock of consistency. I'm excited to share the conversation that I had with the great Rob Bogue on today's The Strategy of Information. Well, Rob, welcome to The Strategy of Information. Uh, I have gotten to know you over the years, first through your, your speaking, your public speaking and your books, um, which we'll get to in that discussion in just a moment. But let's start with just a simple question. And it's a simple question that always ends up meandering because it's, how did you end up in the information profession? Um, I'm not really good at staying in my lane is actually the short answer to that. Um, I started out thinking, oh, I want to be a developer. And I was I was writing some assembly. I was writing C. And I got started. And I was writing C on a Vax. And that was, you know, a lot of fun. Um, it, for for the five people that still know what that is, Digital Equipment Corporation uses these mini computers. And it, it, one of them was called Vax. Um, and we were, uh, we were doing fun things. But then there was also this uh, network thing that started happening. We had this uh, 10 base to network and if anybody knows what that is it's like um if somebody kicked it like the whole network would go down and there'd be some receptionist in your office going it's not working um i was doing that for a while and then i started so i'm bouncing back and forth between these two things and i really just got connected to how do we manage information how do we process the files on the file servers and how do we take the data and transform it with code so that we get it and how do we fetch it and i was i was writing um these programs that would read information from switches i mean telephone switches and we built interfaces to conveyor belts it just it was just, it was just really whatever happened right um and so now i'm now i'm doing information and it's a lot of fun most days so it interfaces with conveyor belts i mean y- yep. you pique my interest i've got to ask what were you doing back then? What was it that you were actually working on? Because that sounds so, like it's off the wall. Yeah, so so the company I was working for uh, was a manufacturer and distributor. So they would import stuff from China and they would manufacture stuff here in the US. And they had a brand new warehousing system and they had an AS400. Um, 
IBM now I called them the I series. I don't even know if they're still around, right? Like we 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 were working on some stuff, and um, we they the people that built the conveyor system, the warehouse system, didn't know how to talk to the AS four hundred, and I'm like it's not that big a deal, right? Like, what do you need? You need messages? Sure, I'll give you messages, right? And you're going to feed me messages back to send to the 400 to tell me which things you put in what spots? Sure, I can do all that. Um, and so that's what I did, right? Like, um, I actually, you know, that was not the, the reading the telephone switches live simultaneously yeah. on a 286, that was the fun part. So Okay. <laughs> So what what were you doing in those early career roles? It was mostly like connecting different systems, different devices, like classic IT stuff. Is is that? Yeah, I mean, at some level, yes. But again, I don't understand my lane. And so <laughs> I think I was a network administrator when I wrote the conveyor belt program. We we built a computer room. Who gets to build computer rooms, right? That's fun. Um, but but it was that that's what it was we oh okay so before the internet before the internet right now we expect that we can transmit email to anywhere on the planet right yeah before the internet they had this thing called CompuServe <laughs> and store and forward mail where people would dial up with their modems you know the oh yeah <laughs> right it sounds like somebody's being strangled <laughs> anyway but it, they had this, and we were sending mail. Honestly, it was so fun. We were sending mail into the Ukraine, right? And you're like, what are you doing in the Ukraine? I'm like, I still don't know. The <laughs> owner of the business used to be at the CIA, and I stopped asking him questions. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we're going to end up on some really fun places in this conversation, aren't we, Rob? I can. <laughs> so as, as you've progressed in your career... Uh, obviously, I saw you speak at some SharePoint Saturday event somewhere in this country back, you know, 15 years ago, somewhere in there. Um, but let's let's talk for a second about how sort of public speaking played an interesting role in your career, because there was there was a point where uh, I was public speaking, you were public speaking, and we would just run into each other you know, every, every other, every third weekend in a random city across the States. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to talk about public speaking for a bit? Yeah, I can. So, um, I never set out to be a public speaker. I think some people are like, Ooh, I want to stand up in front of people and have them stare at me with their beady eyes. <laughs> I, I, that was for me, never the thing. Um, I had a boss who said, Hey, You've been really helpful teaching everybody how to use Office. And I have this thing that I'm doing for the National Hardware Show. And I had a speaker drop out and I need I need somebody to do it. And guess what? You're elected. And I'm like, what? <laughs> right? It's, had you ever yeah. presented like that in, in front of a big show before? Or is this literally your first time? You're just thrown in. It was literally that. But I mean, we were training and I was still, I was yeah. doing some of the training for the organization. And so it's like, you know, whatever, there'll be 30 people in the room. I don't care. Um, you know, and so that, that kind of got me started and then it just never really stopped. Right. Like, Oh, you know how to speak. Well, I thought everybody above about two knows how to speak. No, no, no. <laughs> you know how to speak in front of a room. Yes. And we would go speak and it, or I would go speak and, um, you know, and then, as you and I started bumping into each other, that was, that was SharePoint time, man. Cause yeah. we were, um, so I started working with SharePoint in 2000 before it was actually a product. Yeah. It's called Tahoe. Um, and it sucked. <laughs> it, they took everything that was good and holy and right out of exchange. And then they shot it <laughs> and, and like munched it up. Like, like, I don't know, meatloaf. And that was SharePoint 2001. And we did that. And then we went, we ended what, up, what were the uh, solutions you were doing in those early days? Were you oh, were you like internet. front end? Were you intranets? Yeah. Okay. Oh, it was an intranet. Yeah. It was well, it was SharePoint portal server, right? Like I was gonna say portal the portals me. days. Yeah. Uh and so, you know, so everything had to be round, so it was like a boat portal. No, different yeah. kind of portal. <laughs> but we were um <laughs> we were doing that and so so as you and I were meeting, um, I had probably just launched the SharePoint Shepherd's Guide, so it was about yeah. two thousand and eight. 
uh, somewhere in that range. And I was, I was out, you know, yeah. trying to help people understand at the time, Microsoft didn't have any end user training for SharePoint. They were just like, Hey, good luck with it. Hope you, yeah. hope you can figure it out. Like that is not how you roll out a solution. Um, so yeah, so we, so we did the SharePoint Shepherd's Guide yeah. stuff. Uh, 2008 was the first release and kept doing that. Uh, and that got me speaking, right? That got yeah. me actually on the circuit. Yeah. You were, you were regular. You were yeah. regular on the circuit. Yeah. As, yeah. I miss, I miss it. I mean, I do, I do I actually miss the old days, not just pre COVID. Right. But, but 10 years ago yeah. when it, it, you'd be, it would be like old home week, right? Like it'd be like everybody you hadn't seen in three months and you'd all go out and in SharePoint people had a propensity for drinking. I personally did not partake, but uh, they had a propensity for it. It's true. Um, there were, a, there were a lot of stories that came out of that era. Yeah. Fountains <laughs> and underwear. And there's just stuff that there's stuff you can't unsee. I just have so, to say that you can't unsee it. At some point we'll have to, I, the fountains and underwear conversation. I don't know that story. So uh, it, I, I suppose as people listening to this uh, run into you uh, in, in uh, events, they're going to have to ask you about fountains and underwear. Cause that sounds yes, like will. a very interesting that. story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't me, by the way, just so we're clear. I was not oh, one of the ones drinking. So I was not in my underwear in a fountain. But at that time, there were a lot of people just, clamoring for solutions because all of a sudden you had the software in SharePoint that, you know, there were people that were saying you could do anything with the software, you know, what's your business problem? We'll figure out a solution. Um, and you just had all these people clamoring for solutions and trying to understand the software. And it drove this community to just massive heights where yep. in every city across America and across the world, there were these, you know, regular uh, gatherings, whether it was the meetups or it was the SharePoint Saturdays where it was a different city each week. Right, right. Yeah, it was it was an interesting time. Um, and and I, I so so there's positive, right? And I really do, I missed being able to be there. And there's also negatives too, right? Because it was before we really had the resources we have today. Um, if you've got a question about something in SharePoint or Office 365, Microsoft 365, you Google and you get five wrong answers and one of them's going to be right. But, and, and, and that's the game. It's kind of like, where's Waldo, which is the right answer. Um, but it's, it, but that's different and it's positive because we really didn't have answers before, you know, a decade ago or 12 years ago or 15 years ago, we just didn't have the right answers. Yeah. And. So at that point when you were, you know, heavy on the SharePoint speaking circuit, you had already authored several books. And then yeah. the first books of yours that I came, you know, I, I became aware of was that SharePoint Shepherd series. Um, yeah. But you'd already authored a bunch of books and you're up to nearly 30, 30 books right now. Yeah, um, I think the official counts 28. 28. So two more books and we can finally hit the, the 30 count. Um, all of which are, are great. They're, they're incredible books with incredible depth and you're too kind. You're too humble. Um, but your latest book is the six keys to confident change management, success with digital transformation and more. Um, yep. when you released it, it immediately shot up to the top of the Amazon, uh, business books where uh, it, it stayed on the top for quite some time. Um, tell us about the latest book uh, and then maybe share a bit about just authorship in general and what that's meant for your career. Yeah. Um, well, let me flip that around a little bit. So, yeah. so, I, so, so let me, I got started in it. Um, I was working and uh, one of the, the marketing manager, her husband worked for Macmillan at the time, New Writers. And he said, hey, do you want to help me? I need an editor for this thing. And I'm like, I don't think you understand. Me and commas, we don't get along. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 I need a technical editor, somebody that can say, yeah, this actually does work. I said, yeah, sure, fine. And he goes, oh, and by the way, we pay you. And I'm like, oh, well, then that's even better. Bonus. Um, <laughs> bonus. 
and and so that led to hey i uh the author kind of can't get this done can you do a chapter and it's like yeah i can do a chapter right and then it was like well you know how about a quarter of a book or a third of a book or hey can you fix this one for me right and so that so that started generating titles so i've been doing this for a long time um and in fact there is a post by the way on my blog um that seems ancient at the moment but it's about whether you should publish with a publisher or you should self-publish and the answer is it depends because i'm a consultant and every answer is it depends. <laughs> um but but i've really had i've had some great successes with books in fact i've had some of my friends at wiley um said to me how did you get your book where it is and they were talking about the shepherd's guide and it's like what do you mean and it's like it's outselling a lot of our books <laughs> like great Good. I guess I hit yeah. a demand. I don't, I don't, I don't have an answer for that. Um, but so, so writing has been kind of a part of it. It's all been kind of somewhat, I'm doing educating, sometimes I'm solving weird problems and it's just, you know, whatever. Again, I don't stay in my lane. And so and you're always educating, whether it's your yeah. writing, your speaking, your training, it, it, that's like something that's core to you. Like even in our conversations before we, we sat down to record, we were talking about you know, hardware and software around podcasting. Like yeah. it is core to your being. Yeah. My, my primary thing is learning. I love learning. I'm reading a book a week and I'm writing a book review and, 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 um, so, so yeah, absolutely. So getting back, so getting back to the six keys, right? Like, so, um, I did the shepherd's guide, um, and we did that in 2008 and I thought, oh, people are going to start to learn how to use SharePoint. And they're going to understand and they're going to have portals and blah, 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 right? And like, I'm mean, just, I can hear the, the Smurfs singing in the background <laughs> and it didn't work that way. What happened was people, yeah, they knew how to do the tasks, but they didn't change the way they collaborated or communicated. In fact, my favorite definition of collaboration that I would throw out to people, cause they're like, oh, we want to learn how to collaborate. And I'm like, why do you want to conspire with the enemy? And they're like, what? I'm like, well, that's a better definition than the one you got. Cause you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you mean. Yeah. That collaboration. So all of that stuff. So I get to, I've got to figure out why people aren't changing their organization. And that struck me in this change management. And so the book is the six keys to confident change management. So that caused me to get to uh, building a course and in gathering what amounted to be a decade, okay, a dozen years, a little more, that of experiences and uh, research and all this stuff into this course that's 11 and a half hours recorded and um, 800 pages of student manual. This is like, if you yeah. really have to be the executor, go do this. What, what the six keys is, is it's the cliff notes version. It's the, okay, look, I don't have to be the expert at change, but what I do have to do is be able to converse with the expert at change. I need to manage or lead people who are trying to execute change. And what I need to do is I need to know what are the resources I need to get to them so that they can be successful? How do I need to be thinking about the way that I communicate with them? How do I take an organization that, you know, most organizations are still on file shares and you've got three ECM systems and, 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 how do you take that and you get to a real digital transformation? Um, and I've been, I've been blessed as I, you know, we get, we've talked about conveyors and, and other kind of crazy stuff I've done, but I've been blessed to work with some really great people and we've had the opportunity to really change. When Gardner said, I want to do, we want to change from ECM to content services. I'm like, woo, somebody else making new terminology. Yeah. New labels. <laughs> New labels. I need more of those. Yeah. <laughs> I learned in the Microsoft space. I don't need those. OCX controls are ActiveX controls. And we got .NET servers and all this other stuff. I can go a long time <laughs> on all the names that have been long since lost. Yeah. Um, and our, our profession is, is, does not lack for jargon. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so I thought it was just this thing, right? Like why, why would you do? Well, as they started dealing with customers and we started having five repositories and they each have their own unique things that they do that the business process needs. But in the end of the day, I need to hold on to whatever the heck they did so that I can prove we did it or explain why we did it or whatever. Right. And that caused me 
to want to build content services. So we have a locator and the locator locates documents. You tell me what you want. I go find it. I don't care where it is. And then we've got another piece, which is kind of like a, it's a, a, a mover, a transformer that puts things, it moves things, shuttles them into different places so that we can be cost effective and, and, and. Um, but, but this digital transformation as we're building this, I'm realizing what we're doing is we're transforming, we're transforming the business, we're transforming dev teams, we're transforming the way that people think about it, right? Because people are like, oh, I have to go into my XYZ software. And I'm like, no, you don't go here and tell it what you want. And it's going to find it for you. Um, and that's, and that's, and like I say, that's what led to the six keys is how do we take this change, this digital transformation that I really want to happen? I really want everybody to experience what it's like to have a friction-free working environment. And how do I make that accessible? Uh, and the only way to do that was to, to do a, a book so that, and to do it in a short way. Like it, 800 pages doesn't work, right? You're not going to read War and Peace. Not today. Not, yeah, not today. <laughs> But I, I was able to, so I, I picked up your latest. I was able to read it in, you know, a, a weekend. I, yeah. you know, sat with my coffee and had a great weekend read. Um, and I, I came through that feeling significantly more knowledgeable about change management, which is, you know, it's a topic that I know to some extent because I've worked through projects, but I've never done a deep dive. I've never gone to, to, learn that subject in the way that you present it. You break it down in such a logical way. It's like, yeah, this just makes sense. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. I think the, the change management is an interesting sub profession, related profession, adjacent yeah. profession, whatever we want to call it. Uh, because there is no centralized place for it. Um, yeah. There's two different, or there's two different associations that do uh, change management. Neither of them, really host the foundations. Uh, we, we put on competent change management. I have now 20 change models up there. So if somebody comes to you and, oh, we're going to do change and we're going to do the uh, Levine model and you can go, oh, I don't know. You go to, the, oh, yep, there it is. Um, I know who knows those models. Rob knows those it, models. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and but, but it's um, everybody, you, you, export what you know, right? Oh, I know Cotter's model, or I know Connor's model, or I know, well, what if you had a Rosetta stone that converted from one to the other? And that's more or less what I do. It's like, it's not it's awesome. quite that cool as a Rosetta stone, because that would be neat, <laughs> but it is a, it, it is a way to say this relates to this, relates to this, relates to this. And that's, and that's one of the things that I think helps people, um, orient in a space because of those principles remain the same yep. it's just the methodology yep. that changes yep yep yeah, it's, and it's a lot brilliant. of times just the labels right yeah it's what you're calling them <laughs> yeah. which which set of jargon do you subscribe to yeah yeah uh yeah it's absolutely. so your your career is one that i i find wildly interesting because you've got these deep dive specializations with you know, SharePoint, Office 365, the, the Microsoft tech stack, change management, but you're also this wide generalist as well. So do you, do you consider yourself a, a specialist or a generalist or maybe some combination of the two? Hmm. I think it's probably a combination of the two. I think, um, I think there's a thing that's unique about me. And I'm not saying it's better, good. I'm just saying it's different, right? Yeah. I love digging into the details. I love, like, I, if you and I want to have a conversation about TCP IP and network traffic and the internet, I can talk to you about the flags and, and packet fragmentation. And I love it because it's so interesting. Okay. It was interesting 20 years ago. I'm not sure I would be quite so interested <laughs> now. Um, but I think that's the difference is I think you can be a generalist to some extent. Um, and there's a book called range, um, that talks a lot about this, um, about how, how you, the, the people we need now are the people who can bridge the gaps. Um, and so I think that's the, there's a place for generalists. I think you've got to be willing as a generalist to dive in. 
Um, it's going to say you're, that, I don't, you're pursuing right. your fascination. Yeah. 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 And, 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 you know, as you know, that we did a book, my wife and I did a book for SHRM, for the Society for Human Resource yeah. Management in, in 2019, uh, called Extinguished Burnout, A Practical Guide to Prevention and Recovery. And we run a site, Extinguished Burnout. We made everything on that site free until at least the end of 2021. And you're like, how does a guy who does technology understand burnout? And I'm like, how does a guy that does technology not understand yeah. burnout? <laughs> it, was, it was either you learn everything about it or you succumb to it at some point in your exactly. career. Exactly. So yeah, yeah, exactly. I I yeah. So it's it's extinguishingburnout.com is that one, and then extinguish. confident extinguishburnout.com. Yep. Uh, at, let me just I, I'll just resay that so that uh, we'll we'll edit after the fact. So that one's on extinguishburnout.com. Yep. Okay, and then you also have the confident change management um, yep. training course as well as the book. That is like yep. a deep dive version of the, the the book. Where where is that one at? And we'll we'll make these. Uh, available. That one's on confident. That's on confidentchangemanagement.com. If you go okay, out so there, in, in addition to the resources that are that are out there, and there's two over 200 book reviews now. The 20 change models, yeah. seven assessments, blah blah blah. Right? Like we we're really trying. There's a certain amount of this that we really want to help. Uh, raise the water level of everybody. You ought to be able to orient yourself to change management with all the public materials that we've got available. If you make the decision or what actually typically happens is your company makes the decision you're going to be running a change project um, and you're like, I don't feel equipped for that. Well, then that's what the course is for. The course is like, okay, so I'm going to go spend a week and I'm going to become not an expert as in like meditating on a mountain kind of expert, yeah. <laughs> but you know what? You'll be okay, yeah. right? You're not going to step on anything that's going to go bang. Um, and that's And that's good enough, right? For, for most of us, that is really, that that's the level that, that you need to go and run a project. So yeah. you'd say, you know, the person running the projects should go take the course. The people that are a part of the, a part of the project, the stakeholders, they should get a copy of the book. And then, yeah. you know, change management is going to be baked into this thing from the beginning. Yeah. It's brilliant. Yeah. Um, lastly, you are a longstanding Microsoft MVP. You have been uh, an MVP going back quite some time. Microsoft has bestowed that honor on you. Uh, for for audience members who who may not be familiar, um, can you explain what m being a Microsoft MVP is and maybe what that has meant to you? Yeah, so so being an MVP really technically means that you're willing to share what you know with the community. Um, it doesn't mean you're always right because you're not. Uh, but it does mean that you are interested and willing to help the community understand how to use it more effectively. Uh, so I do have 17 awards now. I originally was awarded for Windows Server Networking. And now you know why I know TCPIP. There it is. Um, and then I, in the mean, I had like a year or two at Commerce Server. Um, so, you know, back when, back when the web was still forming and nobody <laughs> could build a cart. I don't even remember that one. Carts. Yeah, it's pretty scary. Uh, and then since then, it's been SharePoint or Office 365 or Microsoft or whatever they want to call it these days. Uh, in terms of what it's meant to me, I think it's taught me some really interesting lessons. So first of all, what it means from a technical perspective is they give you some licenses. You get to go visit Redmond. You talk to people. Um, you know, I can more or less... Uh, reach out and touch anybody who's at a program manager level. I can find somebody who will help me get there so I can have a conversation. And that's been super helpful over the years as I've dealt with really weird kinds of bugs that I've tripped over. Um, but that's not, not, that's not actually the, the, the most interesting part. The most interesting part is the community part. Um, when I wrote The Shepherd's Guide the first time, um, I said that it's like playing Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. And it is, I always have a phone a friend, right? If you want to talk to me about uh, Azure information protection, I got a guy. If you want to talk to me about records management, I've got a girl who yeah. can tell you everything you want to know about records management. If search is your thing, I have a couple of guys and a couple of girls. And, you know, we can, the answers come because 
I've been able to build relationships with some really amazing people. Um, and I, I really appreciate that. I appreciate that I've had the opportunity to work with good people. I mean, that in my clients, but the MVPs are um, really interesting, eclectic people. One of the guys, um, one of the guys took a summer job uh, as a lumberjack. He did it so he could put it on his resume. <laughs> like he, you did that because you wanted to. He's like, yeah, I wanted to be doing talking to somebody about some really obscure security thing, and then go and oh, by the way, I was lumberjack. <laughs> okay, sure. I sense. mean, everybody's got their goals. <laughs> yeah, everybody's got to have a goal. Oh my! So let's let let's let's put. Uh, let me hand you my shoes for a moment because you have such this, this wide ranging career and you've done so many fascinating things. It's, it was really difficult to decide which questions I was going to ask, which rabbit holes do we want to go down today? Um, Rob, is there a rabbit, a, a rabbit hole that you want to take us down that maybe I've missed or a question or something you want to share with our audience that um, maybe they haven't heard before from you? And the answer can be no. <laughs> no, I, you know, I think I, so I think, so I think we've hit the, I think we've definitely hit the highlights, right? I think that for me, the burnout stuff, um, that's mission. Um, we, I, I know that right now people think burnout is something that's work only. It just isn't. Yeah. Research doesn't say that. I know the World Health Organization does. It's just not right. Um, you can be burned out any time that you feel like you're ineffective. Yeah. Um, and, and, and there's all those resources are free, but let me give you the short version, the super short version. If you're like, if you're feeling like, man, I just don't know. I, ugh, it's, it's hard for me to even think about moving forward. Let me tell you that it is all about your perception of your efficacy. It is your perception of the results you've received the support you can get from others, by the way, you have to ask for it. The self-care you do, how you treat yourself. Oh my gosh, if you're talking to yourself like you're a loser, stop it. Just listen to me. Stop that. Don't yeah. talk to yourself like that. Um, and then it's the demands that are, that are placed on you. People think, I can't say no. My boss said, I got to get this done by 2 p.m. Well, what I, what I counsel the bosses on is if you tell them to do something else, Tell them what they can take off their plate or what they yeah. can delay or, right? Like, don't, like, don't keep piling on because eventually it's going to fall over. Yeah. Uh, so, the, so the burnout stuff is missional, right? Like that's mission. Yeah. And right now, the, the fact that you're giving that out and making it freely available, I mean, that speaks volumes to the person of Rob Bogue. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it is something, um, it, it, it is something that, that we feel pretty strongly about. I'm actually... At the moment, I'm really struggling with how to effectively communicate to people the impact of COVID. Yeah. And we, at the heart of burnout is this feeling, this sense of control. You can go back, Marty Seligman's work, uh, it learned helplessness. He corrected it. He said in the Hope Circuit, which is a book, he, he said, that, look, Stephen Mayer, one of my colleagues, did the fMRI. And it's not, it, it's not that. It's not learned helplessness. It's actually a failure to learn control. Um, and the funny thing is, is control itself is an illusion. We have influence, sometimes great deals of a great deal of influence. And that's amazing. But what COVID has made us all painfully aware of is we don't have control. We, we, you know, we now wear masks to go to the grocery store and we don't go to restaurants or we, they're at 50% or whatever it is because of this little bug that we can't see. And, and so we don't have control because we don't have control. We don't feel like we have personal efficacy because we don't feel like we have personal efficacy. We get burnout or depression. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the research says that they're very similar. Um, so anyway, so burn, so burnout. Yeah. Definitely. Huge topics around burnout. Yeah. Um, and I think the other thing that's interesting that I'm trying to figure out, and I don't have, I don't have it figured out. But the other thing I'm trying to figure out is how do we give 
to other people the things they need to be successful. And it could be a tool, it could be knowledge, it could be environment, it could be whatever. And I can't make somebody successful. What I can do is I can create conditions whereby their success is more probable. Right? A friend of mine used to say, oh yeah, they sent us into the wilderness with a spoon. And I'm like, what good does a spoon do? And he goes, that's the point exactly. Right? <laughs> give me a survival kit, give me a knife, a gun, you know, camping gear, but give me a spoon and I can't do that much. Yeah. Um, and so that's what I, I mean, that's what I want for all of us in the profession. What I want all of us to do is figure out how do we help the next guy yeah. or gal, right? Like I don't, I don't, English is an awful language in that way, but um, how do we help them? How do we make their world just a bit easier? I don't well, know. If, if, there's, if there's anybody that is going to figure out the solution to that, that dilemma, that question, that problem, Rob, I know you'll be on the forefront of it. Well, uh, Rob, thank you so much for joining me today, joining all of us today on the strategy of information. Uh, it is always a pleasure to talk with you and uh, any opportunity I have the chance to, to speak with you, uh, I'm going to take that opportunity. So, Rob, thank you so thank you. much. Um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be talking again soon, I'm sure. Rob Bogue, an incredible human, a brilliant thinker in our space. I'm so thankful for Rob uh, for joining with me and sharing so openly with our incredible audience. And also, thank you for supporting the program by subscribing. You definitely have already subscribed to the program, right? Or by becoming a contributor and making programming like this possible. Learn more about how you can support our program at infogov.net. In our next episode, we'll be talking with my good friend and technologist, Rich Flowers. Uh, I'm excited for you to listen to that episode. Until then, I wish you the absolute best in all of your information endeavors. The Strategy of Information is listener and sponsor supported programming. Subscribing to the podcast is free, but supporters gain access to every episode in HD video, bonus episodes, the occasional extended interview, merch like tote bags and stickers, and so much more. Head to infogov.net to learn more about supporting the program. Corporate sponsorship options are now available for Season 2 of The Strategy of Information. The Strategy of Information with Nick Inglers is available on podcast platforms everywhere and online at infogov.net. This has been a production of infogov.net.